both need to move on. I can't. Not until the man who did it's been punished. We stop this now before we actually kill someone. Go on. Now that you're all fired up and passionate, why don't you kiss me? I'm ringing on behalf of Sir James Corson. Sir James wants to make a settlement. What is that, eh? Next week here on ITV1, a soldier out for revenge when Mobile continues next Monday at 9. Pasta bake, scrambled egg, cottage pie. Life could be tough for the old dishwasher. So give your dishwasher a helping hand. Fairy Active Burst, the all-in-one with the cleaning power of Fairy. They dissolve fast and clean stubborn foods brilliantly. Master business. Now, let's see today's meal in it, instead of yesterday's. Isn't it time you tried the dishwasher product of the year? For a really crispy skin on your roast chicken, simply brush with oil and sprinkle on a chicken oxo cube before roasting. Delicious. Surf on wireless Sky broadband with download speeds of up to 8 megabits. Combine it with Sky Talk and Great Sky TV and get all three for just £26 per month. Call 08702 42 42 42 or visit sky.com. Sky, join in. Open up the dirty window. When you have a great hair day with Pantan, the real you shines through. Introducing new Pantan. Let the best of you shine through. Pantan, shine. Now in Superdrug, get any two Pantan 200ml shampoo or conditioner for $2.99. The calcium in my pity filu helps my bones grow stronger. Now let's go get your marbles. Pretty filu with calcium to help bones grow stronger from your play. For 14 years, ITV has brought you the world's greatest club competition. Now they're rolling. And it's just got better as we give you the chance to take control. Broadband is the newest way to experience the UEFA Champions League. Streaming live in superb quality. Exclusive interviews. We can play better, we will play better. Extra analysis and unlimited access to Tuesday's matches. ITV.com, completing your enjoyment of the Champions League. Northanger Abbey? Is it haunted? No doubt, no doubt. These abbeys usually are. Now, look there. It's exactly as I imagined. Catherine Norland searches for mysteries. Is it really very horrid? It is the most shocking thing in all the world. But only finds her feelings. Beware how you give your heart. Northanger Abbey, part of the Jane Austen season. Sunday at 9, ITV1. Most of us do it every day without thinking. It's perfectly legal. Without it, we will die. <laughs> It's the very thing that sustains us. But a few of us have become so addicted that we're literally eating ourselves to death. Part Time Hospital, at a night special, Tuesday at 9, ITV1. Who is he? Who is he with? We need to interrupt GPS on moving vehicles. Ray Liotta. <laughs> Johnny Lee Miller. I got it under control. Smith, Tuesday at 10, ITV4.
We made the world's first coupe cabriolet in 1934. It's changed a bit since then. The new Peugeot 207 CC. To book a 24-hour test drive, text 24 to 6022. Peugeot, the drive of your life. Sigourney Weaver, Misha Barton and Michael Bolton get the Dame Edna treatment in half an hour here on ITV1 after the latest ITV news with James Mate. Life and death in Iraq, four years after the invasion, this remains a country in despair. On the programme tonight... It was better with Saddam, the man captured by the world's cameras as he toppled the dictator's statue, says life is worse under the Americans. I really regret it. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. We no longer know our friend from our foe. The frontline patrol under attack on the streets of Baghdad with American forces. We have a special report. All but over, the extraordinary claim from Iraq's Prime Minister about sectarian violence. He claims the terrorists of Al-Qaeda are the biggest threat now. I'm live in Baghdad, a city torn apart by bloodshed and murder. Since the invasion, more than 60,000 civilians have lost their lives across the country. In a week of special programmes, ITV News will be reporting on what life is like inside Iraq. Also tonight. Revealed the names of the US troops involved in the incident that led to the death of ITN war reporter Terry Lloyd. And I'm in London with the rest of the day's news, including... Shocked and saddened at the loss of their friend, tributes to stabbed teenager Adam Regis. And no excuses, Freddie Flintoff apologises to fans for his late-night drinking binge. And the top story in the West tonight. Star-struck youngsters are stunned when David Beckham pops in for a kickabout. Good evening from Baghdad at the start of a special week here on ITD News, marking the fourth anniversary of the war in Iraq. And who would have thought then that the aftershock of the invasion would be so polarizing, so powerful now? We begin tonight with one story that symbolizes just how wrong things have gone here. Kazim al Jabouri was the man who took a sledgehammer to the statue of Saddam here in Baghdad four years ago. As the statue came down, Kazim cried with joy. Well, that was then. Today, as we have discovered in collaboration with Guardian Films, he is now totally disillusioned. He wishes that the statue was still standing, that Saddam was still in power. Paul Davis reports. It was one man's act of defiance. What he started led to this. It's an act he now regrets. You won't remember his name, but across the world they remember what Qasim al Jabouri did that day in April four years ago. Elated at the overthrow of the tyrant he hated, Qasim used his considerable strength, leading his neighbours in a symbolic attack on a statue of Saddam Hussein in the Badur Square in central Baghdad near to where he lived. This act, these images broadcast around the globe, came to represent the end of a cruel dictatorship. At the time, they also symbolised a new beginning for Iraq. But four years on, Kazim wishes he hadn't done it. I really regret bringing down the statue. The Americans are worse than a dictatorship. We are entering the fifth year of the American occupation, and every day is worse than the previous day. For this former weightlifting champion to say he'd rather see Saddam back is a damning verdict on today's Iraq as Kasim, who now sells and services motorcycles, had a painful personal experience of the dictator and his family. His bikes attracted the attention of Saddam's sons, who took some without paying. When Kasim complained, he was sent to prison for nine years. They put me in prison for no reason. 
and there were lots of people from my tribe who were also put in prison or hanged. It became my dream ever since I saw them building that statue to one day topple it. Kazim achieved his dream. He says at first he enjoyed the notoriety that went with it. But the new beginning he looked forward to never materialized. He took our camera for a tour of his neighborhood as it is today, past the wreckage left by car bombings and sectarian murders. Kazim blames the Americans for creating conditions for the extremists to exploit. He returns to Fadur's Square where he achieved international fame. Saddam's statue has been replaced by a modernistic sculpture. Locals sarcastically call it the Statue of Liberty. Kazim says it was a mistake to remove the original statue and the real Saddam. I really regret it. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. We no longer know our friend from our foe. Four years ago, he battered Saddam's statue until his hands bled. Today, he's disillusioned. There'll be no more celebrations in Fadur's Square, he says, until the invading army he welcomed that day leaves Iraq to the Iraqis. Paul Davis, ITV News. Well, if Kazim's reaction is an indictment of the situation here, so too is the fact that four years on, American troops are not pulling out. In fact, they're still going in. Our Middle East correspondent Julian Mannion has travelled into Baghdad's Sunni suburb of Ghazalia with one company of men from the US 1st Cavalry Division, hoping to root out militants and halt their attacks. This is Julian's report on living and fighting on Baghdad's front line. These are some of the most dangerous streets in the world. In an American armored Humvee, we drove into the Sunni stronghold of Ghazalia in West Baghdad. Here, any car could contain a bomb. Inside a cordon of tanks, US troops were rapidly building a new combat outpost. It's part of the surge to clear and hold violent areas. This Iraqi family had just been told to leave their home to make way for the new base. The Americans have told them they're not leaving. What would you feel if you were suddenly told to get out of your house? Tell me, what would you feel? Nearby fortifications were going up. American troops had cleared the houses they were taking over and looters were hard at work. What is the reaction of the local people? Because frankly, as we turned up, they, mm. they didn't seem terribly happy. Uh, well, probably not. I mean, we haven't received very much happiness from this sector the entire time we've been here. This is uh, a place that's been uh, brutally war-torn. It's, it's got quite a bit of uh, uh, insurgent elements here, and uh, the people are pretty brutalized. Uh, we find quite a bit of tortured and dead bodies here all the time. This latest American plan is to base troops among the Iraqi population to try to bring law and order. Backing them up, massive armored firepower. But some of the troops admit that their main aim is simply survival. My hopes? I uh, hope to get home alive. As simple Back as that? Family, yeah. <laughs> Are you worried that that might not happen? Uh, I guess sometimes, yeah, I get, I get nervous. The insurgent attack came without warning. A mortar shell landed on a roof next to the new American command post. Hey, go back! Soldiers ran for shelter, and as I looked for cover, another mortar round slammed in. There were no casualties, but one American soldier expressed anger at what he saw as Iraqi ingratitude. Sometimes it upsets me because uh, we try to help them. We try to give them out, help give them a lending hand, and they don't want it. What, what does that actually mean? Does that mean that maybe this operation is not going to succeed? It will succeed. It is going to succeed. Uh, we, got, we, got, we got everything, everything that we need to, to make to help the Iraqi people. Fifteen minutes after the mortar attack, construction is starting again. And the Americans are convinced that what they are doing here can help to reduce the violence. But few others here, least of all the Iraqi people themselves, are in any way convinced of that. Julian Mannion, ITV News, Baghdad. 
Well, the terrorists here don't need any excuse to strike, of course, but if they do, uh, there could be one tomorrow. Saddam's former vice president, Taha Yassin Ramadan, will be hanged in the morning. He was found guilty with Saddam over the deaths of nearly 150 people back in the 1980s. Unless there's a last-minute reprieve, he'll be executed at dawn here in Baghdad. But today ends, like countless others, with more families bereaved. North of here, in Kirkuk, more bombs, 12 dead. Across town here in Baghdad, a bomb near a Shiite mosque killed up to eight worshippers. So 20 dead in a country where extraordinary violence carried out by rival religious groups can sadly seem commonplace. Yet the Iraqi Prime Minister says the sectarian violence between Sunni and Shia is practically over. Nouri al-Maliki told me in an exclusive interview it's the terrorists of al-Qaeda who are responsible for most of the killing now. So is the man running the country really in a state of denial? Ever since a sacred Shia shrine was blown up by suspected Sunni extremists, Iraq has been convulsed by sectarian kidnappings, beheadings and massacres. And at the mercy of the gun is a prime minister charged with bringing peace where there is little hope of it. But when I met him in Baghdad, Nouri al-Maliki made this astonishing claim. Sectarian killing is all but over. It threatened a sectarian war, but it has been ended by the national reconciliation efforts and the work of security forces. But in the few days that we've been here, uh, we've had um, chlorine car bombs, suicide bombs, there have been other car bombs, a mosque has been destroyed, um, there have been murders and bodies have been pulled out of the Tigris with torture marks. <laughs> Yes, there are still attacks done by Al-Qaeda and its allies. They are there. That's why we are tackling the roots of terror. But let me just be clear about this, because it is quite a statement you're making to us today, that you believe that the bitter sectarian fighting between Sunni and Shia, bordering on civil war, is coming to an end, and that Al-Qaeda is your biggest threat. Are you really saying that to us today? Well, leave. Certainly, and I'd like to add that basic struggle is only against Al-Qaeda and members of Saddam regime. As for sectarian fight, it's all but ended. I'm quite sure about that. Within hours of the Prime Minister's bold statement, in another area of Baghdad, a suicide bomber killed several worshippers at a Shiite mosque. Sectarian war or Al-Qaeda? Who knows? The only certainty is that the violence goes on here. Well, I'm joined now by our Middle East correspondent, Julian Mannion, who we saw earlier has been out with American troops. Julian, an extraordinary claim by the Prime Minister. Is it in any sense true? Well, I can only speak for my own observation. On that basis, it is quite difficult to agree with what Prime Minister Maliki had to say. The presence of large numbers of troops may have dampened some of the violence, may have made it more difficult for large groups uh, of militia to move from one area to another and carry out ethnic cleansing. But there's no doubt whatsoever that the fires of ethnic or rather sectarian hatred uh, are burning as fiercely as ever. On the first day we were in Gazlia, for example, an elderly man uh, who normally walks on crutches was dragged out of his car, kidnapped and found murdered two days later. And there were several other cases uh, of similar murders while we were there. Now let's talk about this surge, this increase in American troops. In your view, can it work? It's a critical moment uh, for American policy here in Iraq. Uh, the surge is a policy born out of previous failure uh, and it simply has to work for the credibility of the United States and the credibil credibility of the American president. But there are big problems. Uh, the presence of the troops can, as I say, reduce the violence in some areas. But the difficulty is that it does not appear to be able to actually eradicate and uproot the militia and the terrorist groups. And while these groups retain their capability, uh, they can move their areas of operation, they can change their tactics. And again, I must point out that in Ghazlia, this district where I was, there has actually been a slight upsurge in recent days of violence directed against the Americans. And therefore, I'm afraid, it's really very unclear whether there can be any kind of military solution at all. All right, Julia Mannion, thank you very much. Indeed. Now, not only does uh, this week mark the fourth anniversary of the war in Iraq, it also uh, is four years since our colleagues Terry Lloyd, Fred Nierak and Hussein Osman 
uh, were killed in Iraq, Terry by an American bullet fired almost certainly by a member of the US Marines Red Platoon. Now, after difficult and detailed investigations, ITV News can now reveal the identities of the platoon's members. Penny Marshall reports. One of these Marines from Red Platoon Delta Company is almost certainly the man who killed Terry Lloyd. 16 men, their four tanks and one fatal bullet. Terry was keen to go to Iraq, something he talked about before he went. The fear of, of going to a war zone was, was summed up very nicely for me once when a colleague was asked, how do you feel when you're sent to a war zone? And the answer was, not half as bad as if you're not asked to go to a war zone. But a few days later, he was killed by an American bullet to the head. Initially, Terry and his team had been caught in crossfire between Iraqi and American troops. But he was killed later, as he was being driven away injured from the Americans in an Iraqi minibus. At his inquest last year, the coroner recorded an unlawful killing verdict. None of the Marines was present, their identities withheld. Tonight, ITV News can reveal who they were, according to a Marine source. Sixteen Marines in four tanks made up Red Platoon Delta Company. Who fired the fatal shot is still unknown. Each vehicle had a pet name. In Ticket to Paradise, the platoon commander, Lieutenant Vince Hogan. Behind him, his gunner, loader and driver. Lieutenant Hogan told me he didn't even know there'd been an inquest. In White Devil, Sergeant Sherwood with his three-man crew. These Marines were the closest to Terry's car. The commander of Smoke Wagon was Platoon Sergeant Stephen Heath, again with a team of three. In Size Matters, we have Sergeant Pennyak. He and his men were furthest from the road into Basra where the fighting took place. Matt Offord was the commander of White Platoon, whose tanks arrived on the scene about 10 minutes after the shooting. And he told me, I believe Terry's death is an example of one of the sad accidents that happen in the chaos of war, not the result of carelessness or irresponsible troops, because I knew no such men in Delta Company. It's now four years since Terry Lloyd was killed. The Marines, who the family want to see extradited here to face trial, have been cleared by an internal Marine inquiry. Fred Nairak's widow is seeking more than justice. She needs answers. She's never discovered what happened to her husband, ITN cameraman Fred Nairak. His body has never been found. And she'd like the Marines to tell her what they know. Today, we still uh, have no um, certain certainty about what happened. So I want them to know that. And I want them to, 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 to help us, the family. What happened on the road to Basra four years ago was horrific. The wall of subsequent silence terrible. Naming the Marines today takes everyone another step closer to the truth. Penny Marshall, ITV News. Now, just a footnote to this story. Terry is one of almost 190 journalists killed in Iraq since the conflict began. Because of his death, ITN is launching a campaign for there to be a specific new war crime of killing a journalist. Uh, because of the way international law works, that can't happen until July next year at the earliest. In the meantime, ITN will be lobbying relevant governments, international bodies and other media organisations. And that's all from me and the team here in Baghdad tonight. Back now to James Mates in the studio in London. Mark, thank you. Adam Regis, the 15-year-old stabbed to death on Saturday night, has been mourned by his school and mentioned by politicians. His head teacher called him a model pupil. Mr Blair said new measures were needed against gangs, guns and knives. Isla Traquair reports. They came in their droves, despite the wind, rain, hail and snow, to pay their respects to their friend Adam Regis, the fifth teenager to be murdered in London in six weeks. Teachers and pupils laid tributes throughout the day for the 15-year-old who was stabbed on Saturday night on his way home from the cinema. Friends say the aspiring footballer, whose uncle is Olympic athlete John Regis, was the most unlikely target. People phoned me and told me that Adam Regis was dead, but I didn't believe it because it's not true, because Adam's the kind of person that will never get in trouble, and he was a good friend to anyone. He wasn't like that boy that he'll get in trouble like this. It's heartbreaking, really. He was a down-to-earth person, and he was like really um, sensitive, and he was funny, and like, he took the time to get to know everybody. Prime Minister Tony Blair insisted the latest deaths are not part of a wider problem. 
I think there is a particular issue in amongst particular sections of particular communities where you get families and individuals that are just shut out of society's mainstream, that we need very specific measures to target, and we need to do that at an early stage. Meanwhile, new measures are going to be introduced to record knife crime separately for the first time. Although separate recordings for knife crime will give politicians a better idea of the scale of the problem, it will take time for the full picture to emerge. For people in the street, though, there's no better gauge than the sight of yet another police cordon and floral tributes. Isla Traquair, ITV News, East London. In other news tonight, the July the 21st terror trial has been told that the men accused of plotting to cause carnage on London's transport network didn't mean to kill or injure anyone. Alleged bomber Mukhtar Saeed Ibrahim insisted the whole thing was just a hoax. Sally Clark probably died of natural causes, pathologists said today, but they've asked for more tests. Mrs Clark died suddenly on Friday, four years after being cleared of murdering her sons. Each believes they have the right prescription for the future of the health service. Today, the argument between Labour and the Conservatives intensified. The Prime Minister hit back at David Cameron's suggestion that the government had ripped the heart out of the NHS. Well, to our political correspondent, Chris Schick. Chris. James, it's a service that consumes £90 billion of taxpayers' money. You can see then why politicians want to get on the right side of the NHS. But I think at the moment the deficits, the threats of ward closures, the junior doctors who protested in their thousands at the weekend over reform is all playing into the hands of uh, David Cameron as he moves his party into the centre ground. It meant today there was an angry reaction from Tony Blair to the accusation from David Cameron about the heart of the NHS. Labour have ripped the heart out of our NHS and replaced it with a computer. Let's just focus on the word heart for a moment and heart disease in the NHS and compare today with 10 years ago. 10 years ago, people died on waiting lists, waiting for their heart treatment. Today, people get treated immediately. Tony Blair later said he's yet to see a study which says that the NHS hasn't improved under Labour, all of which you think would go down well with voters. But a poll in tomorrow's Guardian newspaper puts the Tories uh, with a 10-point lead. Now, here's the bad bit for Gordon Brown. If you factor him in as Prime Minister to this survey, then the lead for the Tories stretches to 15 points. It all adds ammunition to Labour MPs who say there should be a serious challenger to Gordon Brown. So I think in his 11th and final budget this week, expect him once again to try and shake off that Dowdy image as Chancellor. OK, Chris, thank you. Let's take a look at the markets now. And Barclays shares dropped almost 1% to 677 pence today after announcing a potential £80 billion merger with the Dutch bank ABN AMRO. The FTSE ended the day at 6,189, up 58 points. In New York, on Wall Street, the Dow Jones closed at 12,226, which is up 115 points. And tonight, the pound is trading at $1.94, up about a tenth of a cent. On to football, and both Manchester United and Chelsea are through to the semi-finals of the FA Cup. United beat Middlesbrough by a goal to nil at Old Trafford in their quarter-final replay. Chelsea beat Tottenham 2-1 in theirs. Matt Rumsey reports. Tottenham versus Chelsea at White Hart Lane was a dull affair until Andrei Shevchenko took hold of the game in the second half at 1-0 and it was a little bit special. Chelsea got a second through Sean Wright Phillips and there was no way back for Spurs. They were awarded a penalty which Robbie Keane netted from the spot but the final score, Chelsea 2, Tottenham 1. Jose Mourinho's team go through to play Blackburn. Meanwhile, Manchester United also claimed their place in the semi-finals with a 1-0 win against Middlesbrough at Old Trafford. That replay was also 0-0 at half-time, but Cristiano Ronaldo was fouled in the Middlesbrough box in the 67th minute. The Portuguese international got up to take the penalty and score the only goal of the game. The treble is still on for Sir Alex Ferguson's team. They'll play Watford in the FA Cup semi-finals. Rumsey, ITV News. Still to come tonight, Freddie Flintoff's apology to cricket fans after his late-night drinking binge. More on that and the main stories in tomorrow's papers. After the news where you are.
Good evening from the West tonight. A school is facing investigation this evening accused of a gross waste of taxpayers' money. It's been revealed that staff spent more than £1,000 from a training budget on a day out at Cheltenham Races. Richard Franklin reports. Sanford School at Seven Springs in Gloucestershire helps children with severe learning difficulties. On Friday, parents have been told the school would shut for a staff training day. What they weren't told was that teachers would spend that day at the races at a cost of £1,600. The local MP says he's horrified that's how the school has used a day set aside for training. All teachers need proper training days, proper training sessions. They need to be well considered what the objective is going to be and I think that this in this case uh, was not uh, thought out carefully enough. No one at the school was available for interview here today but the acting head teacher Helen Bartleman did tell us that the school was closed for a training day, training in the morning and racing she said in the afternoon, a mixture of curriculum planning and team building. She said it was to reward staff for their hard work in getting the school out of special measures. This does appear to be a gross waste of taxpayers' money, but I've ordered an internal investigation into this to find out just what is going on. Senior staff here are insisting this was money well spent, but tonight that's a matter for investigation. Richard Franklin at Seven Springs for the West tonight. Now, they've been dubbed the family from hell. The Hodgkins and Norkit family are notorious after 15 years of complaints from neighbours and the police. Today, mum and dad and all 10 children were finally evicted from their home in the Sea Mills area of Bristol. They've been accused of criminal damage, witness intimidation and even threats to kill. Tonight, though, the council has found them emergency accommodation. And workers at the Augusta Westland helicopter factory in Somerset could have to work for longer. It's being considered as a solution to a £94 million pension deficit at the firm. Another option is to ask staff to increase their pension contributions. The company denies that the fund is in trouble. Now, imagine staying late at school for football practice and then, all of a sudden, David Beckham rolls up. Well, that's exactly what happened in Bristol today. He was there to mark the launch of his new website. He says he chose the City Academy because of its strong links with the game. Ellie Barker was there. This was one football practice this team would never forget. While the world discusses his move to America, this afternoon those boots were firmly on Bristol soil. It's been great. It's been cold. I, I forgot how cold it was actually in England. And uh, no, it's been it's been good. You know, it's great to see the kids enjoying themselves. It's great to see how the the uh, they're actually responding as well to to the school zone and to to the coaches as well. So it's it's been a good day. And we understand this isn't your first time in Bristol. You've been here before. No, I have been here a couple of times before, uh, a long time ago. But uh, yeah, I, I you were never tempted then by uh, City or Rovers. No, not back then. I was a Man United player, so. Yeah, that was, that, was my, uh, that was my team, so... <laughs> but the City Academy felt honoured to be selected for this afternoon, at least. Fantastic. Um, you know, the, the kids are obviously loving everything that they're doing um, and to have him come down to an area um, where they wouldn't obviously get an opportunity like this is fantastic, you know, with all these people wanting to watch. And I think for the next few days we're just going to have football mania down here. It was then inside for the theory lesson. David Beckham was here to mark the start of his academy's website, The School Zone. Just one hour ago, these children thought they were staying for just another ordinary after-school lesson. So imagine their excitement when their hero came in to join them. That's what I thought was a lie. I thought that was like gonna like bring someone. I put a mask on them of David Beckham. Yeah. Uh, I think it's exciting. Yeah. Have you always been a fan of David Beckham? Not really. Well, like, yeah, my brother likes him, so, yeah. Then all too soon he had to leave, but the legacy of his visit is likely to last as long as the immediate tension in him. Ellie Barker in Bristol for the West tonight. Now to one man who's always on the ball. Here's Bob Crampton. Change your outlook with Flybee. Sponsors of ITV West Weather.
Snow flurries rather than snow falls. That's what it's looking like tomorrow when it'll be mostly sunny. Still bitterly cold, though. Tonight, the sleety showers have been dying away, leaving uh, mostly clear skies. As you can see, that means it's going to get colder, down to around about freezing and feeling even chillier in that uh, north wind. Starting bright and crisp tomorrow, plenty of sunshine right through the morning. With more cloud around in the afternoon, there is a risk of isolated snow flurries, but they shouldn't amount to very much at all. The problem is really uh, that wind there picking up, making it feel raw. Nowhere near the mean figures of six or seven we have there. If things go according to plan, the wind dies away on Wednesday. Quite nice too, actually. Dry with sunny periods. Thursday, though, could see rain, but also sleet or snow over high ground. It turns cold once again, too. The temperature seesaws back to mild on Friday with some good sunshine as well. Have a good night. Flybeam, sponsors of ITV West Weather. Well, that's it from us for now. Good night. Hello again. Tonight's headlines. The man who led a symbolic attack on Saddam Hussein's statue back in 2003 says life is worse now than under the dictatorship. Our Middle East correspondent has witnessed the daily struggle against violence in Iraq as US soldiers root out militants on the front line. And ITV News has revealed the names of the US Marines in the platoon which opened fire on our colleague, Terry Lloyd. After his late night antics in the Caribbean, it was a humbled Freddie Flintoff who faced the media today. I am, he said, upset, embarrassed and ashamed. Flintoff was dropped and stripped of the vice captaincy after Court, drinking in a nightclub. Grant Vincent reports on a player laid low by a pedalo. Andrew Flintoff has so often been the hero of English cricket. Well, the hero has screwed up and sat in front of the cameras today with the England coach looking on. He was the penitent man. Upset, um, embarrassment, and ashamed of what I did. All I can do is apologise. Apologise to be honest. Uh, you know, the fans for England have been fantastic over a period of time. Um, you know, they've shown us loyalty and they stuck by us, especially through the series in Australia. Um, you know, and somehow now I've got to, you know, repair that loyalty. On the shores of St Lucia, little more than 24 hours before England's second World Cup game, Freddie and several teammates embarked on a drinking session which ended in him having to be rescued, drunk in charge of a pedalo at four in the morning. Behind these... Behind these glasses tells a thousand stories. Flintoff has, of course, gotten famously, even endearingly, merry in the past, but that was after an Ashes victory. In the middle of a World Cup, the England management had to take action, and so their star player has been stripped of the vice-captaincy. A star player who they warned several times about excessive drinking at the end of the recent tour to Australia, and a star player who's severely out of form. For English cricket fans, a worrying question. What's wrong with Andrew Flintoff? Geraint Vincent, ITV News. Well, time now for a look at tomorrow's papers. And the Independent pictures a grieving mourner in Iraq. It says Iraqis often have a look of half-suppressed panic in their eyes as they tell how violent death has touched them again and again. The Express says that Lord Condon, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner at the time of Princess Diana's death, faces investigation for withholding evidence from the French authorities. The Sun reports government proposals to ban Muslim pupils wearing the veil in the classroom. It says schools can outlaw clothing which impedes security, safety or learning. And the Mail says thousands of pregnant women are left abandoned in maternity wards during labour and often find themselves frightened and isolated. That is all from us for tonight. From the teams in Baghdad and here in London, good night. ITV National Weather, sponsored by PowerGen. Oh dear, you've angered the gods, Lionel. Now, yeah. you've polished off the brown sauce.
Hello again, good evening. It's still a very chilly picture right across the UK as we move through the night and we do have a flash weather warning across Scotland and the Northern Isles for snow as we continue through the second half of the night. The driest conditions across the central swathe and here temperatures very chilly indeed down to around minus two. Looking ahead to tomorrow we continue with a very similar story with those wintry showers around the fringes, the driest conditions inland, temperatures a little bit down on today but the winds easing a little bit so even so it is going to feel fairly chilly and by the time we get to Wednesday signs of improvement we're going to lose that very cold northerly wind and across the bulk of the UK it's not looking too bad mostly dry some sunny spells as well but I'm afraid conditions breaking down from the west with another system moving in and some hill snow expected to see tomorrow. Uh oh, they're getting closer. Positive energy from PowerGen. Sigourney Weaver and Misha Barton are just two of the stars getting the Dean Edna treatment next while Champions League Weekly is at midnight. In a society obsessed with excess, Western civilization is threatened with a new affliction. Most of us do it every day without thinking. It's perfectly legal. Without it, we will die. It's the very thing that sustains us. But a few of us have become so addicted that we're literally eating ourselves to death. Half Time Hospital, a tonight special, Tuesday at 9, ITV1. Yop drinking yogurt for healthy bones. Yop skip and jump. Are you full of it? Full of it. Full of it. Not full of it. Full of it. Full of it. Not full of it. This pasta sauce, full of it. This pasta sauce, not full of it. 75% of the salt you eat is already in everyday foods. Check the label. Salt is your food. Full of it. Clean it to aisle three. Now Glade Freshness and a colour-changing light, only from Glade Light and Scent. Plug it in, plug it in. The long-lasting freshness of a plug-in air freshener, the fun of a colour-changing light show. Plug it in, plug it in. Use any of your favourite Glade fragrances, plug it in and enjoy. Freshness day and night, freshness with the light, plug it in. Plug into freshness and see the light. Plug it in, plug it in. New Glade Light and Scent, Essie Johnson, the family company. Lovely to me, yes you are We've travelled together, we've travelled so far Your tongue it is wise and there's love New Kings Mill great every day Find a flower and a new recipe means deliciously soft bread Every day to me, yes you are and Venus, New great every day From Kings Mill mm -hmm. Thank you Beautiful. Yes, it's sincere. Mm, elegant. Smooth lines. Well matched. Sinseal has developed the complete conservatory, so the roof and windows match perfectly. Sinseal is now the UK's number one choice for conservatories. Call 0800 970 0000. Sinseal. Ask for it by name. How do I turn a journey into a holiday? How do I enjoy a real taste of France before I arrive there? And how can I sleep away the miles instead of driving through the night? We know a way. Sail with Brittany ferries from Portsmouth, Poole or Plymouth and arrive far closer to the holiday regions of France and Spain, saving miles of unnecessary driving. So if you want a more relaxing start to your holiday, we know a way. Call or click for great value fares and very inclusive holidays. When Mother Nature calls and your garden starts to ramble, don't let it get out of order. It's all up and tame it. Visit Harmonsbury and Cheddar Garden Centres, the family firm where quality counts. Are you full of it? Full of it. Full of it. Not full of it. Full of it. Full of it. Salt is your food. Full of it. 
Hi, it's Mrs Jones. I've just come to pick up my car. All right. Just a couple of things you should know about that motor. This car could be automatic, systematic, why it's greasy. On quid. Grease is the word coming soon. There's a look ahead to the quarterfinals of the UEFA Champions League at midnight here on ITV1 after some of Hollywood's biggest stars go up against the Dame. Sponsored by Balsam, deliciously continental biscuits. Patrick! Patrick! Hey, man, I can't believe it! Yes, it's me! You can touch me if you like! Oh, this is synchronicity, look at this! It's addressed to you. I was about to post it. I wanted to check out this new facility everybody's talking about. I need a little TLE. Tender, loving Edna. I don't think there's very much we can do, darlings, if you'll forgive me. Though we do have a radical new follicle resuscitation unit. No, 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 it's not that. I, I hear that you've got this state-of-the-art flotation tank. Yes, we do, and you will love it, Patrick Stewart. It'll remind you of Starship Enterprise. I'm going to save you the postage. Hop in, darling. Quickly, quick sticks. I'm going to fast track you to serenity, Patrick Stewart. But I should warn you that our wonderful treatments do come with a pretty hefty price tag. Well, I've got a bit of money left over from X-Men 3, The Last Stand. Well, off we go. <laughs> Don't worry, Patrick. I am an excellent driver. This beats warp speed, damn it. <laughs> Who else is in treatment tonight? I'm glad you asked, Patrick. Look at this lineup of total non entities. <laughs> in treatment tonight with Dame Edna, Sigourney Weaver, Misha Borton, Michael Bolton, Nancy Delalio, Dr. Bean, Shilpa Shetty, Leslie Patterson, and Gillian McKeith. I haven't heard of any of them. Neither have I, Possum. Oh, Patrick, Patrick, it's the Paps. Look at them, there's been a security leak. We don't need this publicity. Quick sticks, Patrick, feel free to use my rear entrance. I'll make sure your flotation tank is ready. She's a gem, she's a jewel, an icon. She's an angel of light from above. She is poetry in ocean. She's a rock in an ocean of love. Gentlemen, Dame Edna Everidge. 